You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your still sad host, Abraham. Yeah, and I'm your slowly becoming anti-Florida host, Shane. <laughs> We're Psychology Podcast. We talk about the things that people do, and sometimes we really unpack the horrible things that people have done and why they did them. We are coming back on our part two episode discussion about slavery. So if you missed the first part of this, we really unpack the history of slavery in part one. It's probably important for part two, but we are talking about a different aspect of it in the second discussion. We should be able to wrap up this discussion in today episode, I think. But hey, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Yeah, we're glad you're here. If this is the first time you're joining us, then it's a heavy topic to jump into. So true. Hopefully you're you're finding it informative. Yeah. And as I said, go back and check out the first part, probably, although you could probably get through this and you'd still have what you need. And if you're listening to this on the day that it comes out, it is August 30th. So happy National Toasted Marshmallow Day. Ah, yes. It's too bad that, well, the dandies are good. So the dandy, the vegan marshmallows. Right. Those aren't too bad. It's also yeah. International Whale Shark Day, the gentlest of sharks. Indeed. It is Grief Awareness Day. So know that some people have grief. Yes. Leading into that very nicely, it's Frankenstein Day. Oh, that is good. So much of that story has to do with grief, um, but the grief of being alive as a monster. So that's a whole thing. Right. Yeah. It is National Slinky Day. Everyone loves a slinky. Yeah, they do, I think. I don't know anybody who hates Slinkies. I, I think people who hate Slinkies probably dislike fun. <laughs> it's also National Beach Day, so go go hang out there if you're near one. Yeah, and it is also Amaguinia Day. I think I said that right. And this is a type of African pastry. They look sort of like beignet donuts type of things. Oh, I like that. I, I, I'm a big fan of beignets, so I support that. Yeah, it's actually described as a, a Johnny Cake or a Dutch Oleobowl, I don't know what that is, or a Sapolilas. This is its own version, this fried dough bread, and it's supposed to be incredible and delicious. And so uh, celebrating August 30th, which is the Amaguinia Day. I like it. I like it. All right. We're a podcast about psychology, as I said when we started, um, some version of that anyway. And if you like what you hear today, you can support us by picking up some merch. Join us on Patreon. You can leave us a rating and a review. You can subscribe. You can start a reparations project that will pay back all the people who had suffered through slavery and we'll call it why we do what we do reparations. Um, we'd be honored if you did that. That would be really great. I'll talk about the other ways that you could support us at the end of this topic. But as I said, we're picking up on our, our second part of this discussion about slavery. I feel like I'm missing some preamble stuff we get into before we start episode. Are we ready to jump into this or am I missing something? I think we usually say, if you'd like to join us, join us on Patreon. We say that we're an award-nominated podcast. Oh, yeah. That's an important part. Yeah. That should be my opening line anymore. Speaking of which, there's a really good prompt there. If you are able to, if you voted for us in the first round, you should be able to vote for us in the second round. There's two rounds of votes for the People's Choice Podcast Awards. You can go to podcastawards.com. We are in the Skeptics Guide Science and Medicine category. You can vote for us. We would be extremely honored if we won, and we're honestly just extremely honored to have been nominated at all. So thank you to the Academy that is the Podcast Awards Academy, and to everyone who voted for us. And as I said, we're just incredibly grateful to be here. 100%. And I think the only other preamble for this episode would be the content warning. Oh, yes. Thank you. There is a trigger warning in here. We're talking about the um, brutality and violence done to people. This includes things like rape and child abuse and general mutilation and mistreatment. So if that's something that you're unable to sit through, there's really no way around it with this particular topic. So you might want to sit this one out. However, I do encourage you to listen through it because I think this is an important topic if you feel like you can handle it. And if you're in Florida, you really should listen because you're not going to hear it anywhere else. Yeah. Those are content warnings and recommendation to listen anyway. Um, um, if you can, but wanted to make sure that that was out there. And I still feel like there's something I'm missing, but it's fine. We just need to get started on this topic anyway. Absolutely. So in the last episode, we talked about definitions of what slavery is. We talked about some of the history of slavery and kind of where that took us and really spent a lot of time talking about 
specifically what slavery looked like within the colonial United States of America. So looking at that time, kind of how the South benefited from it directly, how the North benefited from it directly as well, and how uh, how it created a, kind of like a, a an economic system that really benefited everybody else but the enslaved people. So today we are going to start diving into what the conditions of slavery looked like in the United States and kind of how that impacted everybody that was living here at the time and how you kind of still feel that that ripple throughout today. That was the exact preamble that I was missing. Thank you. Okay. Hey, there we so, go. I knew we had one. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get into this. The conditions of slavery. Generally and specifically, slavery is brutal coerced labor and subjugating people by dehumanizing them. That's almost its definition. It's getting close. Right. The institution itself cannot work unless you see people as something other than human. You just you you can't make it work because you see people as human otherwise, and then they you can't really justify treating them that way. So most people struggle to inflict that kind of harm on other people when they see them as people, and they had to be then treated as animals or worse for the slave system to exist. This is even true in war, as some people have found that many soldiers aim slightly above the heads of their opponent to avoid killing them. So they don't like to hurt or harm people most of the time. And also treating animals this way. Isn't that easy to do either, but people do get used to it. You see videos of people treating other like other living organisms pretty poorly all the time. And so people do eventually kind of habituate to that. Yeah, but generally speaking, it's not something that is easy for us to do. And part of the reason that in a lot of pre-industrialized cultures, animals, even when they were killed for food, were treated with respect and honor. This what has turned into how, how they are treated, uh, regardless of how you feel about Things like meat consumption um, is is pretty shameful, uh, right. I think, that most people would say. So right. getting back to slavery, though, a day in the life of the slave was work, 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 just like Rihanna would say, almost always from sunup to sundown, regardless of the day of the week, and almost always without any sort of pay or anything even remotely close to that. Right. The most they would typically get would be maybe uh, a place to stay, like sleep on the site that they were working and making sure they were fed. But that was treated as kind of like, shelter like they would for like the maybe the people that own the the plantations in the in the spaces would treat that the same as like having shelter for animals and making sure that the animals were fed so they can continue to do labor they wouldn't treat that as like kind of a human dignity right there is a task system version of slavery common among rice plantation slaves this was that they had a certain amount of work that needed to be completed and once done their work was done for the day so essentially you complete all your work for the day You can go rest and relax, whatever that looks like for you in that space where there's probably not a less a lot of rest and relaxation. Yeah, I mean, first of all, they did their tasks for the day were usually pretty substantial. So it was unlikely they were going to finish without having done probably at least 10 hours of work anyway, and probably almost always more than that. And second, the working conditions on these little rice plantations were reportedly just horrendous, awful working conditions. So not only were you doing that almost all day. And like, yeah, you might be able to get done a little earlier, but your working conditions were terrible. Other systems of slavery that are more the ones that people probably think about as being representative of what slavery was, were often under a driver, which was often another slave. This person was meant to oversee the productivity of the slaves and essentially maintain productivity for all working hours. So that's why they called them a driver. Right. The labor was extremely physically demanding and backbreaking and took place usually in direct sunlight. And if you have ever spent any time in the South, you know that it is incredibly hot and humid here, which makes it even more difficult. I mean, just just this last week where I'm at, we have gotten heat warnings all week Ooh. because it's so hot. It's an oppressive heat. So a lot of this work was done in the sun. And the enslaved folks had to keep up with high rates of productivity, and it was essentially demanded of them that the drivers use torture or threat of torture, such as whipping, scarring, burning, or branding, to keep people on task, to keep people working and working at a pretty fast pace. Now, owners, drivers, and other people on the plantation saw and treated slaves as property, as we alluded to, not as humans, not even burial. I mean, sometimes as sort of like animals at, at best, but generally as property. But another thing about this is their treatment of slaves was completely arbitrary. So they would regularly beat a slave for no reason at all. They could be starved, burned, raped, tortured, and killed. And everyone around them saw that as that owner's freedom to do to their property as they would. 
And there's that use of the word freedom again to justify cruelty to others. I think we talked about this in our episodes discussing freedom and what that meant. Yeah. One little girl actually related a story that kind of goes like this. So, quote, the overseer went to my father one morning and said, Bob, I'm going to whip you this morning. Daddy said, I ain't done nothing. And he said, I know it. I'm going to whip you to keep you from doing something. And he hit him with that cowhide. You know, it would cut the blood out of you with every lick if they hit you hard. End quote. So you see these stories and these anecdotal, this, these reports of people's experiences where people will say, like, this is what happened. They would just hurt us for no reason. Yeah. Not an uncommon story. Like things like that happened all the time. So the slaveholders wouldn't think of their slaves as humans. And to further this, they would try to make it so that the slaves themselves did not think of themselves as humans. They would tell the slaves repeatedly the lies that the slaveholders told themselves and hope that the slaves would internalize this message. Unfortunately and sadly, many of them did internalize that message. They started to think of themselves as being unworthy, that they were only good enough for slaves and that they weren't humans. But most of them did not. It's textbook gaslighting. I mean, that's really what yeah. it is. They were gaslighting yeah. thinking of like, this is the this is what is good for you. Right. I am taking care of you. If you weren't here, it would be so much worse for you. Blah, 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 blah. You hear that kind of bull all the time. Pardon my language. Some tried or try to argue that slavery wasn't so bad. And evidence of this is in the fact that relatively few enslaved people tried to rebel and fight against their oppressors. First, that's a non sequitur. Even if they didn't try to fight back, that doesn't imply that they were okay with their conditions. That doesn't make any sense. There were lots of reasons not to fight back, which leads to the second. When rebellions did happen, the powers that be would often respond by murdering dozens of other enslaved people associated with those involved in the rebellion. Wives, children, friends, other family, etc. And instill practices that were far more brutal as a standard was across all of those enslaved folks. So thus rebelling would almost certainly made have made life worse for the families of those enslaved peoples in the rebellion. And third, enslaved people resisted their oppression in other ways. They usually did it in non-passive or non-aggressive ways. Yes. Non-violent is what I meant to say. Right. Non-violent ways. And of course there were violent uprisings and that sort of thing, but the most of the time that didn't happen. But again, the important thing to understand is like, this idea that slavery wasn't so bad is just completely asinine. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah. Super wrong. And 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 just it's it is a total false lie of nonsense. Under no circumstances was it good for for those folks who were enslaved. But speaking of this way that they did resist, enslaved people resisted their dehumanization in many ways. One way that most slaves resisted this is that they did not stoop to the level of their enslavers by treating them with the kind of brutal cruelty with which they had been treated. They refused to be the chattel that their captors believed them to be, and they maintained their humanity by acting like humans unlike their masters, essentially meaning that they would not allow themselves to become the people or become the objects that they were seen as being. They rose above it, even though that often did not work in their immediate favor. I think it's hard to imagine being in that position and taking on the fact that you're like, you know what, even though I'm being abused and the conditions here are horrible, I'm still going to be the bigger person here. I can't imagine having the wherewithal to take something like that on. That's incredible. The amount of resilience and patience that takes and and still yeah. continues, still continues in, in descendants of folks who have experienced this. I mean, it, it is incredible. Yeah. I mean, that just makes them a thousand times better, a million times better than the people who enslaved them could ever be. Yeah, 100%. Of course, some enslaved folks resisted by engaging in very understandable armed rebellions during which they would coalesce and use weapons to attack their oppressors. These were rare, however. There were a few that were only plots for a rebellion that did not actually happen, and some were questionable as to whether the plot even happened, such as Denmark Vesey, who was a former enslaved person who purchased his freedom. He was accused of plotting to destroy Charleston, South Virginia, but his trial was extremely biased and unfair and may have been orchestrated simply to justify executing him and several other uh, several of his associates, which they did. Yep. You know, so it was basically uh, he bought his freedom and he was there, but he was still put to death and oppressed as a result of people disagreeing with him because of the color of his skin and who he was. Yep, exactly right. It occurs to me that we have uh, we've reached the point at which, although there is much more to unpack, we should really take that ad break. Let the capitalists do what they do, and we'll come right back. (music) 
Okay, so we've been talking about a little bit, um, a little bit of like history here, but I think mostly the conditions of slavery, what that was like. And recently talking about rebellion, and there's another one to talk about because the most probably recognizable and significant rebellion was led by the preacher Nat Turner in 1831. And in this rebellion, a group of 80 slaves raided and killed the white residents of several harms in Southampton, Virginia. Basically, went house to house during the night killing people, anyone that they could find in these sort of slave-holding homes. Most of the victims in this case were women and children because the male slave owners, that were the actual owners there, were at a religious revival getaway camp in North Carolina. That's how that ended up shaking out with the people who died. And again, this is not a fairy tale story. This is a brutal story, and it's difficult to unpack sometimes. Yeah. So you would think that with enslaved people constantly trying to escape, purchase their freedom or leading or joining rebellions, you might take that as a sign that they don't want to be enslaved and that mistreating enslaved people was terrible. But the way the South responded was to make slavery significantly worse. Virginia led several Southern states in passing laws that made preaching among slaves uh, and enslaved people and teaching enslaved people to read made it illegal. So people who were quote unquote property were not allowed to be taught, not allowed to preach and not allowed to read. Yes. So we've talked about these ways that there's been some amount of resisting. We had people who have maintained their dignity. We have people who have um, engaged in uprising and rebellion, but they also resisted oppression in more subtle ways. So apparently some would, they would damage equipment. They would slow down worker production. They would pretend not to understand commands that were given to them. And in this way, they would also sort of try and and fight back and, and resist in ways that were not as overt. Right. They would also resist dehumanization by their commitment to family. So they married, they had children and supported each other in a two parent loving home as long as they were able to. But they were often separated. So that happened quite a bit. Yeah. One plantation owner wrote into the rules of the plantation that enslaved people were not able to marry outside of the plantation for fear that they would gain some sense of freedom or independence. So you you find that there were these kind of arbitrary rules that would work to keep these folks in an oppressed state and keep them on the property, continuing to produce for those folks that were directly benefiting from it. Well, and it speaks to the fact that they knew they could see from the outset that like people wanted freedom and that freedom was good. And they tried to find ways to have them not even think that it was available to them or not see that as being a reality or even existing if they possibly could like, the smoke screen of like, we're going to make it impossible for them to be successful because they can't read, they can't learn, they don't know very much. And that's the way that we're going to maintain them as slaves, I think reveals the hand that they know that this is bad while they're also trying to tell people that it's good. Right. If it was good, then why are people trying to escape it? And why are you preventing them from learning? Like, why wouldn't they just want to stay there anyway? So I think it shows albeit kind of subtly, they, even when they are sitting here saying that it's not that bad, they very much understood how terrible it was, or at least they had a sense of it. Right. Now, most commonly when slaves did run away, then they would run away from captivity and they'd escape to the northern quote-unquote free states or to Canada, which had abolished slavery decades before the United States had. And so that was how they would sometimes get away, although obviously the north was not always a safe place for them to be either. Right. Go Canada. At least, you know, at least they got they got ahead of the game and got rid of it. I know. Right. And another thing, too, to kind of and another thing, because I feel like we, that's what's <laughs> going to keep happening here. Yeah. All those slavers used the Bible to justify their slavery and ensure that the enslaved people were familiar with the passages that talked about people working happily in their bondage. The enslaved would also read the Bible and focus on the stories of Exodus and stories about heroes overcoming great odds such as Daniel and David, preachers would cite the Bible and ask that the lessons contained therein be impressed upon the heart of the oppressors such that the slaveholders would see the error of their ways and grant freedom to the enslaved peoples. Yes. So if we haven't made it abundantly clear by now, slavery was unforgivably horrible unforgivably horrible. Yes. The new old argument now is that slaves may have benefited from their time as slaves. That's a thing that the re- part of the reason that we're talking about this today, part of what we have already alluded to in portions of this discussion is that there's this now conversation happening where in Florida, people are being taught that there may have been some benefit to being a slave. For those of you who hear this and say, quote, they did do your homework. 
end quote. If you're saying that to us and we're saying that they did not benefit as slaves, first, you're an asshole. Second, uh-huh. there was some evidence that some slaves were able to use some of their experience and subsequent employment, but major caveats need to be unpacked to understand that at all. Right. First, we have no reason to think that they would have been unable to get those jobs even without their experience. So there's nothing to say that their experience working in an enslaved space was the thing that gave them the skill to work that job. They probably could have and very likely would have gotten that job without that experience to begin with. Also, they could have gotten that and much better experience without ever having to have been slaves. There's obviously training and intern mentorships like people gain jobs without having been slaves for you know all of human history since yes. we've ever had jobs. So yes. that is just a nonsense argument. That's how learning works. Yes. Also, no one would have voluntarily been an enslaved person to gain these skills. These hypothetical skills, these these hypothesized skills they talk about, nobody would have done that voluntarily. Also, having been a slave more likely and more often stifle the development of, of effective skill building. They likely would have gotten much better training in other situations. But just because they learned something doesn't mean that they learned a good, you know, learned a good amount or a good way of doing things. They just may have had something that they learned. One, they learned it under coercion, and two, many of those places made it illegal for them to read. Right. So they had a hard time learning other things that they could have learned and benefited from and had greater skills. So Right. Ugh. So it stifled the development. So much to unpack here. So the original argument that enslaved people benefited from slavery, it implies that there are benefits to slavery in general, besides all the things that we just talked about. Any silver lining right. here is a disgusting attempt to minimize suffering and victimization. If you try to defend slavery, f*** you. Like, there is no way to defend it without outing right. yourself as a as an inherent racist. Yeah. Just because someone can find ways to make use of their traumatic experiences does not justify putting them through traumatic experiences. The victim may subsequently choose to, like, let's say you have a victim of assault. They may choose to subsequently get extremely skilled in self-defense. This does not mean that assault then wasn't so bad. Like, you wouldn't say that someone who is a victim of sexual assault then, like, gained useful skills. They're like, oh, well, at least now you're going to be more attentive to strangers who are around you. I think that is an extremely offensive and inappropriate position to take. Right. They would have never wanted to have been assaulted, even if it meant that they got better at attending to strangers, even if it meant that they got better to self-defense. That is an asinine, stupid stupid argument to make that nobody should be making like just because there's some ever silver lining to to that does not mean that being a victim was ever an okay thing for that to have happened yeah right Uh, slavery was not a job training exercise and making an argument that there is silver lining is not it's 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 so inappropriate it's unfair to the folks that still suffer from it and it's a ridiculous it's a ridiculous thing it they Think of it like they should never have to need you should never have to need a silver lining. Yeah, that's as simple as that. Like you should never have to say that there's a silver lining to this really bad thing because that bad thing shouldn't have happened to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> OK, well, it's a little <laughs> early for a break, but I think it would be a, a kind of jarring segue to transition to our next topic. Maybe not. I don't know. It's pretty on brand. Yeah, but <laughs> let's let's go ahead and let the advertisers do the thing and we'll come back with something about Nazis. All right. So we've been talking about about slavery, the conditions of slavery. And the thing is, like the the practice of American slavery. And I mean, there's other things to talk about slavery outside of the United States in the past, now and into the future. But one of the interesting things is slavery and how it related to Nazi Germany and Hitler specifically. So Adolf Hitler. For those of you who don't know, the uh, leader of the Nazi party was a huge fan of American racism. In his famous book, Mein Kampf, Hitler celebrated and acknowledged America's great success in isolating citizenship based on race by, quote, excluding certain races from naturalization, end quote. Right. So just to be clear, Hitler found things like American slavery to be a good example Of how racism should be done. Yes. So just kind of keep that in mind. For those of you who are defending slavery, just know that he thought that that was like a really good practice. Hitler also pointed to the treatment of indigenous people of North America as a demonstration for concentration camps, writing, quote, 
Concentration camps were not invented in Germany. It is the English who are their inventors using this institution to gradually break the backs of other nations, end quote. So <laughs> again, he just keeps going on. Basically, he used America as an example for the, the Third Reich. Yeah, he loved what America did. Hitler greatly admired the Jim Crow laws of the South that further treated people with dark skin as a disparate species, unworthy of the same rights and liberties as the, quote, dominant race, end quote. He also further cited Jim Crow laws in developing Nazi treatment of Jews, saying essentially, like, in defense of this, everyone does this already, so it's okay for Germany to do it, too. <laughs> Yeah. Like that was Jim Crow directly inspired the ghettos. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was probably other things that went into it, but that was a variable that inspired the ghettos that he put Jews into. Like America was a muse for the Holocaust. Yeah, it was. American eugenists were also very popular among the Nazis who directly applied the hypothesis of eugenics into their genocidal campaign. So even then, eugenicists were stoking fear in support of their claims by arguing that if people do not control the breeding of, quote, undesirables, that minority groups would take over the white race in America, which we still hear people say that today, which is absurd. Yep. The great replacement theory is ridiculous. Yep. California developed a sterilization program in 1909 that forced sterilization of people who were, quote, feeble minded or often incarcerated people. This directly inspired Nazi forced sterilization programs in correspondence with their eugenics movement. Yeah. California was not always the blue state it is today. They actually very much led the way in some very oppressive policies for a while. Uh -huh. I think they also voted for Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is a relatively recent development that it became <laughs> a, a, a place of, of liberal ideas. Right. Anyway, the American Immigration Act of 1924 imposed quotas and bans on who could migrate to the country and from where. These laws focused specifically on Asian countries and other countries with people of other races that might try to come to the U.S. And it also prevented, almost by design here, so this is the American Immigration Act, this also prevented later many Jewish people from arriving to the U.S. during the Holocaust, including Anne Frank and her family. So where we could have been a safe haven for people seeking asylum, we were not. We were not. We were very isolationists at the time. Yeah. We definitely tried to close our borders to every single person, and it became a real problem. I mean, it, for, it essentially forced us into the war eventually. As much as, as we like to champion uh, the U.S. being a part of the Allied forces against Germany, the things that we were doing directly helped and benefited Hitler. Uh-huh. Yeah. And gave him inspiration. Now, most horribly, Nevada was the first U.S. state to use a gas chemical to carry out a death sentence of an incarcerated inmate. The chemical was Zyklon B, which a chemist modified for use in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. So the U.S. was also directly responsible for the development of that particular method of, of death. Yep. Ugh, so that's where man. we're at, I guess. So bad. Yeah. Okay, now and into the future. So versions of slavery do still exist, largely in the form of human trafficking, forced labor, human bondage, sex trafficking, and involuntary prostitution, with as many as an estimated 40 million people who may be in some sort of bondage, although it has gotten increasingly surreptitious and difficult to track. And there are countries still that use slave labor, for example, mining precious metals and rare earth minerals that are used in things like batteries. So that's a, that is a, a thing that that also still goes on. You know, I think this is one of those things where as we evolve as a species, we end up having better descriptive language for things that are occurring. These things were happening before too: human trafficking, forced labor, human bondage, like sex trafficking, True. involuntary prostitution. This was happening before as well. Yeah. We just have better language for it. So like it, we're getting more specific with these things. They've also gotten sneakier about it. Right, right. And so one of the questions that we posit here is that we want to kind of know what benefit that Ron DeSantis thinks or would like to suppose these enslaved people are getting from their captivity. I would love to know what he thinks, what these folks today are gaining from those experiences. Yeah, he sees slavery is so good. So presumably he could find silver lining for the children who are being sex trafficked. So just as an implication of this, I'm thinking that we could say that Ron DeSantis is generally in support of the silver lining afforded by child sex trafficking. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair alignment with his views. We should be a little bit cautious here because I believe that where this came out of was the board of people that he put in position of power, that they're the ones who's, who made this change about slavery. So it's Ron DeSantis is putting people in a position who champion that sex slavery of children is a good thing. So Ron DeSantis and friends is what you're saying. Right. Yes. And okay. company. Yeah. yeah. They, they work together. Fair. Matt Gates, 
you know. Yeah. Well, he's well. We know he's a big fan of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I need I need to hire a lawyer immediately. <laughs> <laughs> The Global Slavery Index has identified that North Korea, Uzbekistan, Cambodia, India, and Qatar have the highest concentrations of modern slavery, in case you're wondering where this is taking place largely today. Right. There are efforts to continue to end slavery. The website Restavec Freedom offers guidance as to how to recognize slavery and what to do if you see it. And here's a direct quote from their site. Quote, if a person cannot leave their job, reports low wages, isn't properly cared for, or never speaks for themselves, they may be victims of slavery. For children, look for a lack of access to education, poor nutrition, shabby clothing, and a lack of playtime. If you notice children's beds or clothing in factories or businesses where they don't belong, this is an indicator of child slavery. If you recognize any of these signs, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888 to report it. Yes. Please do not let slavery and trafficking go unreported. Yes. People will try and do something about it. Yeah. Maybe less so in Florida, but generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. As a general rule, people aren't all terrible, so people will try to do some work around this. Yes. We do have some interesting tidbits to unpack, which is a couple of uh, of things that have happened around this. So there's this thing called miscegenation. This is a marriage between two people of different ethnicities. It was a term primarily used to deride such a practice as inappropriate or even gross at the time that it was largely used in the 17 and 1800s. Maryland passed the very first anti-miscegenation statute in 1664, banning the marriage between a black person and a white person. And of course, many states soon followed suit afterward. But what's interesting is that although these have been repealed over time, and I think many of the later added states never had laws like that to begin with, the very last state in the country to repeal their ban on interracial marriage, which was Alabama, and they did so in, can you guess what year? I have no idea. I think if you were to guess, you might say like 1950s, 1960s. Sure. It was the year 2000. 2000. Just 23 years ago is when Alabama officially repealed their anti-interracial wild. marriage. Like, what the f***, Alabama? Yeah. That particular thing is a global phenomenon. Like, that's not, like, unique to the United States in terms of, like, right? like you know, interracial marriages. I mean, you listen to Trevor Noah's entire life story, and he was, like, his his book is called Born a Crime because he was right. the result of a, a crime in South Africa during apartheid. So, like, this is yeah. a thing that's occurring everywhere. But, man, uh, the year 2000? Right. <laughs> and people were that's probably absurd. mad about it. People are still mad about it, I'm sure. Yeah, I bet. I, you're probably right. They're probably going to say, like, how this is destroying the country and we're heading the wrong direction. Like, that's a talking point I'm sure happened. Right. And maybe is happening. Right. Is currently happening, I'm sure. Slavery was not considered globally illegal until 1948 under the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, you know, was probably spawned after World War II and all the things that came up. That was probably an important discussion to have in that space. Now, many people have now heard of Juneteenth as it is recently a federal holiday in the United States. For those who are unfamiliar, the specific date and reason for recognizing it comes from the fact that in Texas, they decided they just wouldn't tell the slaves that slavery had ended. They didn't have the internet. They barely had phones. They probably didn't get national newspapers. So they were just like, well, just going to not say anything and keep them as slaves. So on June 19th, 1865, two years After the Emancipation Proclamation went to effect, General Gordon Granger ordered the final enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation in Texas, and the slaveholders were forced to let their slaves go. And even though we can recognize that as being something that is good for us to acknowledge, celebrate, take some time, and bring attention to the black community and this thing that is important to them for very understandable reasons, there are now even politicians who argue that we should get rid of Juneteenth, and they're... One of the arguments that they make is that it's too new. We can't recognize everything and give holidays to everything, they say. And I'm just like, what the hell? First of all, like every holiday that we have was too new at some point, right? And it has nevertheless stayed on the book. And I think that having this one holiday does not mean that we're on a slippery slope to nobody working ever. That is a nonsense argument to make. So anyway, useful to know about Juneteenth, what it stands for, what it means. The people who argue that we should get rid of it are ignorant ass. Yes. Agreed. All right. I think we're ready for some take-home points. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest take-home point 
here is that slavery is and was and always will be a disgusting, horrible, inhuman way to treat another person as if somehow their lives are worth less than the people subjugating them. It was it was brutal. It, it is brutal, too. I mean, let's let, let's be real. It's like modern yeah. slavery is also brutal. It's also cruel. It's traumatizing and as close as anything can be to evil. It is purely evil through and through. There is no benefit to it. And it does not make any sense that anybody would advocate for the need to use this unless you're just an evil person. And I think, you know, from uh, we can take a sort of scientific skeptical lens and say that there is no such thing as evil. I'd be happy to have that argument and that that discussion. But I think, like like I said, this is as close as it gets to what we would probably describe as being evil. And so that's obviously meaning that it's a thing that we should stop and avoid and never do again ever to anybody. Right. And I think another big tanko point for me here is that the slaves won their freedom because they fought for it in all the ways and that they were able to, you know, but they should have never had to fight for their freedom in the first place. These are human beings that were treated as something other than human beings for a very long time. And millions of people were treated this way. It's just, it's a horrible stain, I think on the entire human race as a species historically, and hopefully one that we can learn from and do better and, and never do again, understanding that is a thing that is still going on, but is a thing that needs to end. It needs to end flat out. Like there is no justification for it. It is a horrible, terrible practice that should have never started in the first place and definitely should discontinue immediately and never can never happen again. And you know, I, I, I don't know, this comes up sometimes where people are like, when certain industries get replaced and they're like, oh, now those people are out of a job. And I'm like, I do understand the necessity of like having employment, making money, being able to support yourself. And like that, uh, if there was a necessary evil, then in some ways capitalism is it. Although I think you could also argue that is entirely unnecessary. Right. I shed no tears for the captors of enslaved children who lose their job. None whatsoever. Right. Like there is no reason to feel job. sorry for that. Yeah. That is not a job that anyone should have. Right. There's no justification in maintaining an industry just because somebody might lose their job. If the industry goes away, if the industry is a terrible one that is hurting people. Right. Not a thing that I think you can justify. Right. And I think going back to kind of the essence and the and the understanding of the why we started the show, right? The why we do what we do part of this. Like, why did people do this thing? And it ultimately came down to a lot of profit. I mean, people made a lot of money and yeah. gained a lot of resources and a lot of wealth on the backs of the folks that were enslaved. I mean, that is really a primary driver for a lot of folks that were involved in this. Now, why did they go so far as to horrifically abuse and treat folks the way they did? I mean, that's that's an entirely different conversation. But when we start unpacking this and we start looking at what was going on, what were the primary motivators and what's the context? I mean, it really came down to gaining more resources as a result of this particular industry. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, I think that's what we have to say about slavery. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up for today, Shane? I would just like to add that it's bad. It's just bad. I don't know why we have to say <laughs> that. Bad. I don't know why it's it's ridiculous that we have to say it, but like it is bad. It's a really bad thing. So the last thing I would add is spend some time reading about the effects of this because we just talked yeah. about it up and through up through you know the emancipation and kind of like some of the stuff that leads up to World War II, but we have not talked about the long lasting ramifications of this particular time in history. And it's really important to know that this is, you know, while there is modern slavery, everything that we have seen and everything that we've talked about has rippled through our entire society and continues to impact marginalized folks. Yes. Yeah. And I think there, there is a thing that I actually wanted to add in that I, I kind of forgot about, which is that there is also a version of slave labor that kind of exists in the, how the prison system often treats prisoners Yes, and forcing them to do labor for next to nothing or sometimes nothing. It looks sort of like indentured servitude sometimes, but looks like slavery at other times. So I think that that's another version of, of where this exists. And it's worth unpacking at some point the prison system more generally and why it's not appropriate to even treat prisoners as slaves. I think that does come back to at some level that we need to be humans, treating other humans as humans. And understanding even when we justify for one reason or another incarcerating someone and taking away their general liberty and freedom, that we shall, still shouldn't treat them inhumanely. Right. So that's, uh, I think, a, a discussion for down the road, but uh, one that I forgot that I wanted to include as part of our, our talk today. Sure. I think it's an important discussion. I agree. We should have never had to say that this is bad, but we find ourselves in that position now, I guess. So yeah. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Also, by the way, Ron, child sex slavery is bad. Just in case. Yeah, you weren't. Just in case you weren't aware. 
Yeah. No silver linings there. Okay. I think that's what we have to say. We do have some recommendations to give, which is a part where we like to share some recommendations that we have. Usually it's something that we've found joy in, but sometimes it's like an activity or thing that you do. And we'll talk about that in a second. First, I need to acknowledge that again, if you'd like to support the show, you can join us on Patreon. If you do that, you get access to all these behind the scenes content, bonus materials, and ad free episodes. The people who have done that, who have make this, this show possible, we are eternally grateful to. And that includes Mike M, Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, Brian, and Ashley. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. Also, thank you so much to my team. Right now, we have writing and fact-checking from Shane and myself, audio production and editing from Justin, and our social media coordinator is Emma Wilson. Thank you all very much to my team for you guys doing just the amazing work that you do, allowing this show to continue on what it's doing. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And of course, thank you everyone to listening. Thank you for recording with me today, Shane. Go vote for us for podcastawards.com for our final round of votes. We're hoping hoping to clinch that win, but of course, we're uh, super stoked to even be considered for that. So thank you for those who did vote. Thank you if you do go and vote. Anything else before we get to recommendations? Nope, nothing else on my end. Lovely. Let's do it. Recommendations. Okay, I am recommending, this is tangential to slavery, but I'm going to go ahead and recommend this movie that is very old now called Schindler's List from director Steven Spielberg. If you haven't seen it already, it is a heartbreaking movie that has a lot of ups and downs. I think it's an extremely well done movie. It is not a feel good movie, but it's an extremely well done movie that's largely about the Holocaust and uh, people there and, and specifically one German person who tried to help as many Jewish people as he possibly could after initially doing a bunch of the wrong things and then he did the right thing. But right. Yeah. So that's, that's the movie. It is a heavy watch, but it's a good watch. So I recommend it. Yeah, it is a good one. It is a good one. Over the last couple episodes, I've been thinking about, you know, this is such a big topic and it's really difficult to unpack. And I and I thought it would be good to give somebody like some folks recommendations to you as a starting point for kind of improving processes around this or kind of Hmm. thoughts or actions around this. So my recommendation is the work of W.E.B. Du Bois or some people say Du Bois. I've seen both of those and heard both of those. But uh, right now I'm looking at the enunciation guide that says Du Bois. Okay, I would pronounce it too blah, but that's, I'm not, uh, who, who am I to say? Agreed. So he was a civil rights activist. He did a lot of really great work in the United States around improving civil rights for black folks. He's done a lot of writings and a lot of kind of anti-racist writings are written, like started and kind of reference his work to begin with. Yeah. He was one of the founders of the NAACP and he probably deserves his own episode just because of the amount yeah. of stuff that he has done and the, and the work that he's done around that. It's probably worth unpacking, but I, I strongly recommend That if you ever get a chance, if you are interested in doing more work around anti-racist work or just kind of understanding systemic racism and all that stuff, he is a good place to start. Yeah. He is kind of like one of the people that had a lot of the seminal works around kind of creating the anti-racist movement. So, So definitely don't sleep on his work. He's done some really powerful things. So that's just a starting place for you. That's great. I've definitely read some snippets and excerpts. I've never read an entire piece that he's written. I know that Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote the book on how to be an anti-racist, um, referenced it a lot, but also had some criticisms of Dubois. Sure. Yeah. Which I think is, is fair and legitimate. So I think we've recommended how to be an anti-racist on this podcast before, but that's a, we certainly an awesome, have. absolutely fantastic book to go check out. Um, I think is a good pair to this book or not this, this obviously you're not referencing a specific book but i think if you read some w.e.b dubois if you read some ibram, ibram x kendi i think you'll have a good well-rounded uh history Agreed. of sort of anti-racism and civil rights work i'm glad that you said that like you, you like you know putting somebody up a, on a pedestal and kind of creating a monolith out of a single person for any sort of work around that is really detrimental to your learning so definitely Absolutely. pair that up and, and really like know that he created a lot of stuff but also know that there are some discussions around that. So you have to see all the discussions around the folks that are impacted by this. Yeah, great. Love that. Okay, so we ended with some heavier recommendations as well. But if you would like to tell us anything that we got right, if you'd like to provide some constructive and kind criticism, you can email us directly. We'd like to hear from, if you'd like to tell us anything at all. I mean, you can just tell us about what a great day you had today. You can email <laughs> us directly, info at www.wwdpodcast.com. You can reach out to us on all the social media platforms. As I said, leave us a rating and review. Subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you so much for listening. Is there anything else you need to add before we wrap it up today, Shane? Nothing else on my end. All right, then. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. And we are out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes 
by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.